Hi everybody, so today we're going to get into the swing era, uh, but first we're going to talk about um, some of the other influences that were going on uh, to this jazz music, um, and then sort of some of the transitional stuff that was going on going into uh, the swing era. So first of all, um, you know, this this was dance music at the at the beginning, and uh, there were some folks who were very very good at tap dancing, um, and you know you can imagine how um, the tap dancing, you know, where you're making um, basically music with your feet, uh, it's sort of this percussive you know music with your feet, and you know the drums of jazz, you know, they went together very well, and they influenced each other quite a bit. Uh, I'm gonna put a um, uh, a link at the end of this video uh, to this Nicholas Brothers and Cab Calloway performance. Now this is from much, much later than the era that we're talking about uh, here, the 20s. This is, I think that's probably from the 40s, that uh, that particular video. Um, but it's, it's just the most amazing video if you have not seen it. It's uh, uh, pretty incredible. So please take, take some time to check it out. Um, Stride pianist I put here and uh, you know so once again you know where there were bars that did not have large bands or maybe uh, you know had people filling in between bands um, there were these piano players who were kind of their own orchestra and remember this idea of stride um, is uh, you know maybe uh, in the left hand the the piano players would do something like this doing it with two hands they would do that with their their left hand only and then that would allow their right hand to um, you know sort of meander around and improvise uh, but James P. Johnson, Willie the Lion Smith, Fats Waller were some of the famous uh, stride piano players at the time. Um, also, you know, uh, a lot of bands were starting to collaborate with singers. So I had mentioned, you know, Bessie Smith before, uh, you know, the sort of blues side of things merging with jazz. Uh, Cab Calloway from the video that I hope you guys are going to watch. Um, you know, started collaborating with a lot of these instrumental bands. Um, but the, the thing that we are going to talk about uh, very quickly here is how arranging um, started to become a very important thing. As the bands got larger, um, you had to start writing things down. Um, you know, say that, you know, your third saxophone player couldn't make it one night well how are they how are you going to get another saxophone player just to sit into the band so you know at that point you have to have some of this music uh, written down so um we're about to talk about Fletcher Henderson and Don Redman, but there's a few other uh, important arrangers uh, of the time um so let's get into it let's talk about Fletcher Henderson so Fletcher, and the thing you guys need to remember about Fletcher, and this is going to be definitely a test and quiz question, I would, I would qualify him as the most important uh, bridge figure between uh, early jazz and the swing era. Uh, he employed um, lots of famous musicians that we're going to talk about. Um, but, you know, interestingly enough, he, he, he wasn't really, um, you know, focused on music at first he actually has a master's and he had a master's in chemistry from atlanta university but uh i guess just got into music so much he couldn't he couldn't get enough of it but uh, he was a great arranger of music um we're going to talk about don redmond he's not going to be one of our superheroes but he probably should be um and actually, we're going to play two Don, Don Redman tunes for you uh, right now. Uh, this first one we're going to play, this is actually um, uh, kind of become a pretty famous tune of Fletcher Henderson's very, very early tune. This is from 1924 uh, called Copenhagen. And I'm going to annotate a few things there, but we're going to listen for, uh, I mean, this is this is early. I mean, this is early. I mean, Louis Armstrong uh, is on this recording. He plays the trumpet solo on this recording. Uh, and remember, we had... You know, we listened to uh, um, Louis Armstrong's first solo on a record was just the year before that. So this was super early. Um, and it's interesting that this uh, recording, it has a much larger band. Uh, we're going to hear three woodwinds, I believe, three trumpets and a trombone in the front line on this. And there's a lot more homophony on this recording, which is sort of presaging, um, you know, the, the main sort of sound of the swing era that's coming up. So let's, let's check it out. Now, like I said, I'm going to annotate it um, and see what we got. I'm going to go th at least through um, the ensemble after Louis solo.
going to stop it there just for time's sake. But wow, a lot going on in there. We have, you know, these homophonic sections, uh, you know, with the clarinet trio. Um, I think that uh, Fletcher was uh, influenced by the polka bands of the time. That was a standard sort of standard um, instrumentation in polka bands was to have uh, a few clarinets in the front line. Um, but just a great solo there by, um, uh, by Louis Armstrong. Um, beautiful clarinet trio sound in there. Then we heard a little brass shout section. Um, just a lot, lot going on in there. And then, you know, there are a few little sections where we hear some sort of echoes of the polyphony that's been going on uh, in early jazz. Uh, but this is definitely more sophisticated uh, writing uh, than I think we've heard so far. Um, you know, once again, I like to, you know, um, we, we need to remember about Henderson that he, you know, is this bridge figure and he's going to uh, remain important for the next uh, few uh, decades. Um, he's actually going to fuel uh, Benny Goodman's orchestra um, that we're going to talk about very soon. Um, I want to play one other uh, tune for you here by Don Rudman. So that was arranged by Don Rudman. Um, uh, but that was the Fletcher Henderson band playing that 1924. This next one I'm going to play for you. Um, I, I actually just recently discovered there's two different versions of this, and I think this might be actually the 1940 version, not the 1931 version. But I do like uh, I like the sound of this one a little bit better. So we're going to check this out. This is called Chant of the Weed, and you probably know what the weed is. <laughs> we live in California. Uh, anyway... Um, uh, but you'll hear it's it's got a very sort of dreamy, um, sort of unsettled sort of sound to it, and he's actually uh, achieving that through that whole tone scale uh, that we heard um, in that big spider back in a mist composition in the previous video. So check this out. I think you're really gonna like this. This is interesting. <laughs> Once again, I hate to turn that off, but for time's sake, um, make sure you listen to these all the way through uh, on your own. So uh, that was a little bit of Don Redman there playing um, alto sax at the end. Um, but very interesting sound, isn't it? So he uses that whole tone scale. There it is. In the opening. And he actually does a very similar thing to In a Mist. So In a Mist... Um, the uh, chords descend chromatically. He does the same thing here. He does this. So there's another whole tone scale descending by a half step, and then he ends up here. So um, once again, sort of using it for to create this sort of dreamy um, sort of uh, environment, right? Um, but then he kind of he kind of comes back to the tonality, and we hear a little bit of um, uh, sort of like this uh, you know sort of dance feel going on. Uh, another thing to uh, to check out in that recording, you'll notice that the piano and the bass are actually playing some quarter notes on all four beats. So that has a little bit different feel. It has more of what we would call a walking bass feel. Um, as opposed to that in two um, sort of feel that the other tunes, um, including Copenhagen, uh, had up to this point. Um, anyway, very, very great arranger, uh, Don Redman. Uh, let's move on to um, another sort of giant who is emerging during this era. And once again, the saxophone is now starting to get 
to be a fairly popular instrument. So we heard it there in, uh, in Don Redmond's band. Um, uh, we're going to go back to Fletcher Henderson's band here, though, for a second. Um, this was uh, 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 one of the places that you know we first started hearing uh, Coleman Hawkins. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to play uh, next tune for you uh, is called the Stampede that he played with uh, Fletcher Henderson. But uh, um, Coleman Hawkins, we are going to consider him. He's really considered the great sa first great saxophonist of jazz. Now we remember we did talk about Sidney Bechet uh, coming before um, Coleman Hawkins, but remember Sidney was playing a soprano sax and sort of you know taking the role of the clarinet. So you know he's I, I don't really consider him you know what kind of moving towards what the saxophone was going to become. Um, you know, like I said, it was sort of a hybrid of the clarinet part and, and this new uh, soprano sax that he got. Coleman Hawkins uh, definitely influenced pretty much every saxophone player uh, after him. So his first recordings uh, with Mamie Smith and her jazz hounds in 22. Uh, once again, like I said, join Fletcher Henderson. We're going to listen to that in one second. Um, actually went over to Europe, kind of like uh, Bechet did uh, before him. Um, uh, had a, quite a long career. He played with all kinds of different people. Uh, actually got into, into bop uh, during the bebop era, which we're going to talk about. Um, but one of the, probably his most famous recording um, is his recording of Body and Soul in 1939, which we're also going to listen to. But first of all, let's, let's listen to this very early example of, um, of Coleman Hawkins with the Fletcher Henderson Band. Uh, this is the Stampede. <laughs> at you know barely 20 years old uh and just virtuosic as can be i mean this uh this guy was definitely very very something something very special uh let's go ahead and fast forward to um his body and soul recording now you know once again uh these folks who we were talking about you know some of their careers span a long time and so you know we're now fast forwarding about 15 years um to hear this body and soul a recording and actually this was a very important recording moving into the 40s um, I think a lot of the people who developed bebop listened to this recording and checked it out it's a pretty interesting one in that he doesn't really sort of alludes to the melody of body and soul but doesn't really play it he really starts to improvise right off the bat and um, just seems to be have this wellspring of ideas once again I'm probably gonna stop it before it's it's done but um, let's check a little bit of it, of it out Mm-hmm. 
sort of a travesty to turn it off at this point. But once again, I'm just trying to save some time. Please listen to that on your own. Um, you know, his sound is just very, very big and vibrant. It has this beautiful vibrato, which is, means, you know, when, when he's playing uh, a long note, there's a bit of a, a shaking of, of the long note. Um, he also tends to play all over the horn, up and down the horn. I would call that sort of like a vertical concept. Uh, you know, he plays up high and down low and sort of traverses the entire range uh, of the horn. Um, we want to remember that because we're actually going to um, contrast his sound and his style to another saxophone player coming up on the uh, following video. Uh, so I'm going to end it there for this video. Uh, we'll see you in the next one.